your, is, your, is your fan on under here? Your fan's on, right? I stand back here for a minute. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? <laughs> I think I'll just pick it up in this hand. <laughs> Well, good morning. It's great to see everybody this morning. If you've been on vacation, welcome back. We've missed you. And uh, the group downstairs, welcome. Glad to have everyone here worshiping with us this morning. If you're at home on Zoom, <clears throat> you probably have the new Zoom address. If you do not, it's in the church bulletin. You can also, if you're worshiping at home, you can also pick up your Lord's Supper kits here on Sunday mornings beginning at 8.30, and uh, you can drop off your contribution. A few announcements to be made today. The Orphan's Lifeline donations are due next Sunday, August 9th, at Gina DiCarlo. And Gina comes to the early service, so if you come to the late service and you want to make a contribution, you can hand that to one of the elders or David. Uh, Graduation parties, uh, Tyler Shostak's open house is Saturday, August 8th from 3 to 9 p.m. The address is in the bulletin. It's also posted on the back bulletin board here in the back of the auditorium. Noah Shostak's open house was canceled. Concerns about COVID. And uh, no, if you would like to send Noah a card, his address is in the bulletin. Cash, credit, money orders, whatever. Right, Noah? Okay. Just... Uh, Congratulations to these young men on their graduation from high school and their future endeavors. We're very proud of them. A uh, number on our sick list this morning. Please keep Kim, uh, Kim Tomaszewski in your prayers. Her surgeries have been postponed for now because of the risk involved. She will be going through uh, treatments from several different ophthalmologists and uh, hopefully they can put surgery off for some time but surgery may be the final result of all this. So keep Tim, Kim in your prayers. Betty Parsons fell at home and fractured her left foot. Uh, Betty is here this morning. She's got a pair of shoes at home, just like the one she has on here this morning. So she's got a shoe on her left foot. Be careful, don't step on her. Uh, Bob Mullins had angioplasty and a stent inserted this week due to a blocked artery. Keep Yolanda Joyner in your prayers as she plans on moving forward toward being placed on the transplant list. Faye Gallagher had hip replacement surgery this past Tuesday, and she is uh, recovering. Uh, Dorothy Avis has requested prayers for her husband, Brian, who's had several health issues he's dealing with. Brian Metz, the son of Becky Metz, continues to need our prayers. He is improving, but st he still has some significant health issues. Helen Siegel has requested prayers for her sister, Patricia Pleva, and her niece, Angela Pleva. Angela is in a California hospital in critical condition. Mike Davidson has requested prayers for his brother, Larry Davidson, who is being, had been diagnosed with cancer and undergoing treatment. Carol Burks has requested prayers for her daughter, Lisa Mitchell, who Lisa is recovering from recent neck surgery. Kim Landry has an update on Mike Veneer, her son's father, Mike is healing well after surgery for throat cancer. Uh, Faye Porter was taken to the hospital this week with a mild stroke. So let's keep uh, all of these in our prayers. Also, uh, Caitlin Thomas is requesting prayers for a high school classmate that she graduated with, Reese Booth. He passed away this past week, Reese Booth. So keep all of these in your prayers. Remember them with cards if you have that opportunity to cheer them up as well. Our scripture reading this morning to prepare for the lesson is taken from Deuteronomy chapter 31, verses 6 through 8. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in the presence of all Israel, Be strong and courageous, for you must go with this people into the land that the Lord swore to their ancestors to give them, and you must divide it among them as their inheritance. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged.
Let's stand together as we sing this song. <clears throat> In Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, armed through the curses, drought, and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, what fears are still when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin. On him was laid, here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. The bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, since curse has lost his grip on me, for I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns calls me home here in the power of Christ I stand no power of hell no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand for his return or calls me home here in the power of Christ I stand. Please be seated. Let us go to our Father in prayer. Can I pray? <clears throat> our Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time that we can come together and praise your name. Father, we thank you that we can be called your children and that we have this avenue of prayer. Father, we submit our petition of names with health issues. We ask that you be with each and every one that was listed this morning by Brother Randy. Watch over them, heal them, bless them, and bring them back to their health if it is your will. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your son. Father, at this time, we ask you to also Bless our elders, our deacons, our ministers, our teachers, our members. Watch over us, Father. Help us to grow spiritually and numerically. Father, we pray for our country. We pray that we can return to you and use you as our source. Father, we ask a blessing on our first responders, our policemen, our firemen, our EMTs, our frontline health workers. Watch over them during this time. Father, remove this COVID-19 disease from our, our land. Heal us, Father. Father, help us to keep our hearts and minds in your word. Help us to focus on you. Father, forgive us when we fail you. Be with us, Father. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you, Steve. Let's prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper at this time. <clears throat> On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Oh, that old rugged cross, so despised by the world, has a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear it to dark Calvary. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown in that old rugged cross, stained with blood so divine, a wondrous attraction I see. For it was on that old cross, Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown To the old rugged cross I will ever be true, its shame and reproach gladly bear. Then he'll call me someday to my home far away, where his glory forever I'll share. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross, Till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown. I believe there's a very significant and profound reason that Jesus would have us pause right here in the midst of our worshiping God to think about him. And as we gather around this table, to focus on his life and more importantly upon his death. It is the death of Jesus on the cross that reminds us of God's amazing love.
It is God's love that allowed Jesus to endure the crucifixion for our sakes, on our behalf. I'd like to read from the book of Ephesians. And here Paul is writing to the Ephesians in hopes to <clears throat> help them to understand what he would like them to know about God's amazing love. This is found in chapter, 30, chapter 3, and I'll begin with uh, verse 18. I'll begin with verse 17. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. It is God who wants to spend eternity with us. And it is Jesus Christ who has made that possible. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, thank you for Jesus Christ. Father, we're humbled to come around this table once again on this first day of the week to reaffirm to you our commitment, our belief in Jesus Christ as your son. We're so very grateful, Father, that he was willing to take the place of our sins on the cross And moreover, Father, we're grateful for his love that he continues to shower down upon us from day to day, even today. Father, we're humbled to come around this table and to partake of this bread that represents his body. We're, Father, we are grateful to, to you and we reaffirm, Father, the covenant that we have with you through Jesus Christ and the bond that we have with you through him. Father, we're grateful for the hope that we have of eternal life because of what Jesus has done for us. Father, we pray your blessings upon this bread and upon us as we partake of it in his name. Amen. Let's give thanks for the cup. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, eternal, loving God, it is in like manner, Father, that we're mindful, so very mindful, of the power of Jesus' blood in our lives. The power that has redeemed us, bought us back, washed us and cleansed us and allowed us, Father, to present ourselves to you clean. We're grateful, Father, once again, as we meet here on the first day of the week around this table. We're so very grateful that Jesus shed his blood and that we can be washed by his blood and cleansed. 
and that his blood stands as evidence of the covenant that you have with us. Father, we reaffirm our covenant with you. And we pray, Father, that you would continue to give us courage in the world around us that we exist in. Father, we're thankful for Jesus Christ. And we're thankful for his blood. We pray your blessings, Father, upon this cup and upon us as we partake of it. In his name. Once again, I'd like to thank everyone for being so diligent in seeing that uh, your contribution makes it here to the building somehow. Um, we're doing very well with our finances and able to keep up with the commitments that we have, the people that are depending upon us, and we're, we're grateful to be able to do that. But moreover, we're grateful to be able to do it on behalf of the Lord, because those people uh, depend upon us, but we know the Lord depends upon us too. Thank you very much. Ed speaks for all the elders in that we really appreciate your support. It means so much, not just to us, but to the Lord to see your faithfulness. And now let's stand and sing this song before our lesson this morning. It's interesting, David, how the Lord's Supper dovetails right into your sermon, isn't it? That's great. What a great message you're about to hear from beginning in the book of Matthew. And now let's sing together about our God. There is beyond the azure blue a God concealed from human sight. He is a God that we should know and frame the worlds with his great might. There is a God, he is alive, in him we live, and we survive from dust our God, created man, he is our God, the great I am. There a long, long time ago, a God whose voice the prophets heard. He is a God that we should know, who speaks from his inspired word. There is a God, he is alive, in him we live. And we survive from dust our God, created man. He is our God, the great I am. Secure is life from mortal mind. God holds a germ within his hand. Though men may search, they cannot find. For God alone does understand. There is a God, he is alive, in him we live, and we survive from dust our God, created man. He is our God, the great I am. Our God, whose son upon a tree, a life was willing there to give, that he from sin by set man free, and evermore with him could live. There is a God, he is alive, in him we live. And we survive from dust our God, created man. He is our God, the great I am. 
let's be seated, please. Thank you, Russ. Good morning, everybody. Man, the singing has sounded good this morning. I'm enjoying it. I always love hearing Diane's voice and others, but you know, just something over there. It just sounds so good. You know, as we think of today's lesson, you know, the last few weeks we've done Esther, we've looked at uh, Ezekiel in a couple part series. Today, if you look on the screen behind me, it says Women of Courage. We're going to continue to look at various men and women that grace the pages of Scripture. And today we're going to look at Women of Courage, and it has to do with the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You see, because when you think about Jesus' life, at the height of his ministry, were there not just thousands of people who were just, you know, flogging to him and were just trying to just uh, be around him? And then all of a sudden, Jesus realized, and he knew all along, but he really realized at one point that, you know, people are there for the spectacle. They're there for the show. They're there to have their bellies filled. They're there for healings, physical healings, and not so much for the spiritual uh, food of the word and the truth. And so Jesus started to teach something about eating my flesh and drinking my blood. And so that really separated the sheep from the goats. And so when we think about the women of courage here this morning, these women are found at the foot of the cross of Jesus Christ. You see, because Jesus, he had many people who were willing to follow him when things were going well. But when things got difficult, all of a sudden, they started to scatter, men and women alike. And we've seen that in the very end. When Jesus' uh, uh, apostles and Jesus' disciples were mostly hiding and cowering in fear, there were a faithful few. A faithful few that had the type of faith that they were willing to put their faith in action, willing to sacrifice on behalf, if need be, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And you found these women at the foot of the cross. There was a man there as well. And he was the Apostle John. And he was the Apostle that Jesus loved. And so as we think about this lesson here today, it kind of it kind of goes hand in hand with the Lord's Supper. It goes hand in hand with why we come together on the first day of the week, the Lord's Day. Have you ever wondered why they gather together every Lord's Day? Have you ever really thought about that? Because God knows we're fickle, and He knows that we have forgetful memories. We're forgetful individuals. And well, because, well, many times we don't, we often kind of put things in uh, ahead of God sometimes. And if we were only called to come together once a month or once a quarter or a few times a year, I guarantee you, you'd find where people would start to put things uh, in, in, uh, that take priority over those few meetings. But God calls us to remember his sacrifice each and every week because he never wanted us to forget exactly what Jesus did on our behalf, why he went to the cross to take upon the sins of the world, to take upon your sins and my sins, and to go to that cross so that we have a chance to live. You know, even in the life of Christ, there were good days and bad days. There are times in this world when people will want to praise your name. And there are times in this world when people will curse your name not too long after. Brethren, there are times when you can be on top of the world one day and in the gutter the next. And do you know what's the difference? You know what, this, uh, what we have in common with Jesus? He had those same days. Remember the Gospels, they tell us that the Jews were so enthusiastic. You know, the week leading up to Jesus' crucifixion, Jesus is going to Jerusalem, and they're, they're shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna! And they're, they're laying down their cloaks, and they're, they're giving them uh, the, the, the welcome treatment of a king, and they're cutting palm branches, and they're waving them, which was customary that they would do for a king or a visiting a deity. And so they were giving him this, this great uh, treatment. And then all of a sudden, the shouts of Hosanna, Hosanna, went from that to crucify him, crucify him. All in a very short period of time. One minute, he was the one they wanted to force and to make the king. And the next minute, they're saying, kill him. And so have you ever really thought about that? How fickle we are as individuals and people? But you know, things have changed very quickly for Christ. Because he was crucified, and crucif crucifixion was a very slow and horrible death. And when you were crucified, you died from a fixation. Roman law was saved, and, and crucifixion under Roman law was saved for the worst of society. And the Roman government would look to make an example out of you by crucifying you and showing that if when they people seen that, that this is what happens to anybody who would stand up against Roman might. 
and how futile it would be to stand up against Roman might. You see, and it wasn't just the Romans who were guilty, because the Jews were guilty as well. The same people who wanted to make him a king were now saying, crucify him. And so, brothers and sisters, we see that uh, from the scene of the cross, how Jesus had fallen so quickly from the graces of the people who wanted to make him a king. Brethren, notice what it says in Matthew chapter 27, in verse 40 through 42. This is in the full few verses. It's paraphrasing. But when we think about what they were shouting, in the beginning they were saying, come down from that cross, Jesus, if you're the Son of God. And then it says on the screen behind me, he saved others, but he can't save himself. Let him come down from the cross if he's the Son of God. Let him come down from the cross and we'll believe in him. Brethren, you see the same people who wanted to make him a king, the same people who were, uh, saw Jesus and all the miracles, the wonders and the signs that he was doing in their midst had now turned on him and were looking to crucify him. But we are told in the Gospels that four women and one gentleman stood at the foot of the cross as disciples of Jesus Christ, and they had a type of love for God that was uh, infectious. They had the type of love for God that was born out of sacrifice and a willingness to sacrifice. Because on the screen behind me, it says, but standing at the foot of the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary of Clo the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. And so when you look at who was standing there, these are some, there are some who will try to explain that these women were standing at the foot of the cross in those days and it, because it was, they, they didn't have anything to worry about because, because women were unimportant. And that, so there really wasn't no inherent danger for these women to be at the foot of the cross. But I honestly believe that it's just an absolutely pitiful explanation because I believe they had such a, such a faith that they were willing to put their faith on the line. They were willing to stand at the foot of the cross when all the men were cowering in fear and hiding because they didn't want to end up like their Lord and their Savior. They didn't want to end up on a cross next to him. And so the presence of these women was not because they were unimportant, but the presence of these women was because they had a faith in God that was willing to be sacrificial if need be. I am convinced, brothers and sisters, that they were there because they loved Jesus and they were willing to us to be put on a cross next to him if that's what it took. They were baffled. They were heartbroken. They were literally drenched in sorrow, but they were there. And they were giving Jesus support because Jesus didn't die on that cross alone because he could look down and he could see the love radiating from his disciples, his mother, his aunt. And we could look at uh, 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 Mary Magdalene and Mary uh, uh, Clopas, or uh, Mary, uh, uh, the wife of Clopas. And we could look at these women and we could look at the apostle that Jesus loved. And so, brothers and sisters, we need to understand that there's a beautiful old hymn that many times congregations sing, and it's called Jesus, Keep Me Near the Cross. But when you think about that song, Jesus, Keep Me Near the Cross, I wonder how many of us would have had the courage to stand at the foot of that cross. I wonder how many of us would have had the type of faith that was so sacrificial that we were so unconcerned about our safety and our well-being that I would have put myself in the position to possibly suffer alongside him. You see, because to be known uh, by, the, the, by the authorities of somebody who they were crucifying puts you in harm's way many times because you were guilty by association many times. And so what would we have done? Would we have dared to climb the hill and stand next to Jesus as he died? Or would we have been cowering as so many of his disciples were? I mean, think about it. Brothers and sisters, we have to understand that these four women, they showed, cur they showed courage in the face of adversity, courage in the face of persecution. And they were willing to do whatever it took to make sure that Jesus knew that they were there. They had his back and they were there for him in love. They were there for him in spirits. And they were there for him because of the truth that he taught. Brothers and sisters, let's get started by examining some of these women. First and foremost, Mary, the wife of Clopas, we really don't know anything about, so there's not much we can say. But Mary, the mother of Jesus, well, we know much about Mary, do we not? We know her story well. We know of the angel that appeared to Mary. The angel appears to Mary and told her that, her, that she would have a son and that she would be the mother of God's son, Emmanuel. And they would call him Emmanuel, meaning what? God is with us and that he would be the promised Messiah. We know of his miraculous birth and of the amazing events that accompanied his birth and how God provided for not only Mary and Joseph, but he provided for them as well as the protection of his son. 
And we are told that Mary treasured all these things in her heart in Luke chapter 2 and verse 51. Well, what did she treasure? You see, because as, uh, as, as Jesus was around the age of 12, they went to Jerusalem and they were in the temple. And then they decided after they left, they were leaving Jerusalem and they were going back home. And what happened? They get about a half a day's journey away and they realize, hey, anybody see Jesus? And they left them behind. And so they go back frantically searching for Jesus. My mom left me at a garage sale too, by the way, when I was a kid. And it's not fun. But Jesus was okay. You know, Jesus, he was, he, was, <laughs> he was in the temple. And he's at the temple. And the parents come in there and they finally find him. And they said, where have you been? He said, don't you know I must be about my father's business? And can you imagine the words that came out of Jesus' mouth? And then she compares that to what the angel had to say but when she was conceived, when she conceived Jesus, and then when Jesus was born, knowing that he was going to be, uh, that she was going to have God's son, knowing that she was going to uh, give birth to the Messiah. And so, brothers and sisters, we know so much about Mary. And it says in Luke 2 and 51 that she treasured all these things in her heart. She must have longed for the day for her son to become, uh, the, to become, uh, to be proclaimed as the, the long-awaited Messiah, the Savior of Israel, and usher in the great and wonderful day of the Lord. I mean, she had to be looking so forward to that because then everything that she had gone through would have been worth it. You know, the gossip at Nazareth, the flight into Egypt because they had to leave in the middle of the night, the years of hardship after Joseph was gone, and even the loneliness of Jesus leaving to begin his earthly ministry. We had to see that it would have all been wet, uh, worth it. The day that her son... The, the predicted Messiah would become the king of the Jews. And, and so she had to be waiting for this. She had to be excited for this. And then it happens. And he has a three-year earthly ministry. And then all of a sudden, her world comes crashing down. And her world must have just kind of collapsed at her feet. Why? Because it's her son is hanging from a cross. She had to be thinking, was he really the son of God? Why then is he hanging from a tree if he is the king of the Jews, the divine savior. God, what is happening, she must have been thinking. She had to have so many questions. And I'm sure she didn't know all the answers. But Mary also loved Jesus with a sacrificial kind of love. You know why? Because while he may, be, while he may have been looked at in the eyes of the Roman government as uh, somebody who is worthy of crucifixion, somebody who was a sinner, somebody who was a criminal, while he was, uh, while he was looked at by his Jewish brethren as a blasphemer and as somebody who deserved death, this was, the, this was Mary's son. This was her flesh and blood that was hanging from that tree. And the mother, the, the love of a mother, brothers and sisters, we know that the love of true mothers is a sacrificial type of love. And she stood at the foot of that cross, and she wailed out for her son, and I guarantee you there would have been nothing, even her own death, if it took, it that, if it took that being the case, that would have kept her from standing at the foot of that cross. And so, brethren, we also know now of the next individual. The next individual was Salome, the sister to Mary the mother of Jesus. John mentions her in, in his gospel, but he doesn't mention her name. But we know that in the gospel of Mark, it makes it quite clear that this was Salome, the wife of Zebedee, the mother of James and John. So what does that mean? Well, that means that Jesus, James, and John must have been first cousins. And Salome, Mary's sister, was his aunt. But there is one brief moment that we see in Matthew chapter 20 that shows that she once received a rebuke from Jesus. But Jesus was the type of individual that could rebuke you, and you'd love him anyways. We need to learn a lesson about how we can rebuke individuals, and they could still love us anyways. You see, brethren, she had a great faith in Jesus as her Lord and Savior. But we also see that in chapter 20 of the Gospel of Matthew, that he rebuked her one time because she came to Jesus, and she asked Jesus a question. She says, when you enter into your kingdom, I would like for you to make my sons to one to sit on the left, and for one to sit on the right. And so he, she asked them to have chief, chief places in his kingdom. You see, brothers and sisters, though, when you think about this question that Salome asked, it's hard not to be disappointed in her. It's hard not to think too harshly about her. I mean, especially if you're a parent, haven't you always wanted the best for your children? I mean, think about who here watches March Madness, right? If you watch March Madness and you watch any type of college sports and the parents are involved, what happens? You're, you're in the thick of the game. There's a crucial moment. There's a free throw that they're getting ready to take, or there's a timeout, and the, the, the tensions are high, and what do they do? 
they pan to the crowd. And who do they look for? The mothers and the fathers. And they look at the expressions. I mean, I wonder how many times when her children were younger that she would uh, go up to their coaches. Maybe they're in fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, early high school, and say, I, I just, coach, I'm telling you, if you just give Johnny a chance, I know he's got great talent. I know he could help you. I know he could help make the team better. I know he could give us a better chance to win. Just give him a chance, coach. I wonder how many times that parents have said things like that. So is it really that strange that if Salome, Mary's sister, Jesus' aunt, knows and believes that he is the Lord and Savior of the world, that he is the King of the Jews, is it really that out of the ordinary for her to go up to Jesus, her nephew, and say, hey, nephew, when you enter into your kingdom, why don't you make James and John your chiefs? Why don't you have one sit on your left and one sit on your right so they can receive glory with you in heaven? But you see, there's something that happens. Jesus rebukes her. He rejected her request. And he said to her, you do not know what you are asking for. And then Jesus turned and he asked James and John, he says, do you think you could drink from the cup in which I'm about to drink? And they said, yeah, we could drink from that cup. And Jesus looked at him and said, you'll drink of that cup. And so we think about that story. We think about Salome and how she stands at the foot of the cross. And I wonder as she stands at the foot of the cross and Jesus has the crown of thorns on his head, bleeding from all parts of his body, from being whipped and scourged, and the crown, and if you've ever even scratched your skull, and you realize how much it bleeds, and it bleeds, and it bleeds, and you could have seen that he had just been covered in blood, he was in pain and in sorrow, I wonder if for the first time she understood why, she re why he rejected her request. I wonder if it was for the first time that she understood the bitter cup that Jesus had to drink from. And if she really honestly wanted her cup, her sons to drink from that cup, it's the cup that Jesus asked for God to remove from him. You remember in the night before his death in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus is praying to God, and he's praying so seriously, and he's praying so fervently that blood is coming literally from his sweat pores, and he's, he's sweating out blood, and that's a real medical condition. And they say it makes your skin so very sensitive that even the, somebody touching your skin is going to be painful. Yeah, that was before he was scourged. That was before he was nailed to a cross that those things happened. And so what's the point? Brothers and sisters, we have to understand Jesus prayed for that cup to be taken away from him. But he also said, Father, not my will, but your will be done. You see that cup that Jesus had to drink of? It contained every war that has ever been fought, every murder that has ever been committed, every rape or sexual uh, misconduct that has been committed, every sin that has been committed, all the atrocities of, of, of humankind were, were, were contained inside that cup that Jesus had to drink. And he had to suffer for our sins and our, mis, our misdeeds. But in one way, haven't we all kind of been like Salome? Haven't we all been like Jesus' aunt, wanting the blessings but without wanting the burdens? I mean, haven't we wanted the crown but not necessarily to carry our cross day by day as we go through this thing called life? Like Salome, we have wanted the benefits, but we haven't wanted the responsibilities that go along with those benefits. You see, Jesus had denied her request, and yet she was there at the foot of the cross. She was there in her presence at the cross. It showed her humility for an individual who was able to be rebuked by Jesus and yet still be at the foot of the cross, paying honor and homage to the one she called Lord. And then we get to Mary Magdalene. Her name is familiar to us, and we don't know a whole lot about her, but what we do know tells us a lot. For example, we know that she was a follower of Jesus, and that on the resurrection morning, she was at his tomb before any of the apostles. Let that sink in for a minute. We're talking about women of courage, the women who were at the cross of Jesus Christ, who had the courage, had the strength, had the faith to be there. And yet, where were the men? They were hiding, cowering in fear. Who was the first one to appear? At the tomb? Well, in Mark 16 and 9, it says, And when Jesus rose early in the morning, uh, early on the first day of the week, he appeared who to first to Mary Magdalene, of whom she had seven driven out seven demons. Well, now that's an interesting statement, isn't it? Out of whom Jesus had driven out seven demons. Brothers and sisters, if you believe in the God of the Bible, then you also must believe in Satan. If you believe in angels, you must also believe in demons. 
You see, brothers and sisters, because the demons, those are the counterparts of angels, and they are the servants of Satan in this evil realm. And here we are told that Mary Magdalene had seven demons that were contained within her. We also know that Jesus drove out the demons of many individuals. You remember the one who had so many demons that were inside of him, they called themselves legion. And so we know that Jesus has all authority. How do we know Jesus has all authority? Because he has power over the spirit realm and he has power over the physical realm. When Jesus told the demons to depart, they had to depart because he had all authority. Because they knew that Jesus was God. And they said, Jesus, we know who you are, son of God. And he would cast them out and tell them not to speak no more. And they had to listen. He had authority in heaven and on earth. And as Jesus gave the command, those demons came out of her. And for the very first time in Mary Magdalene's life, for the first time her burden of sin had been lifted. She was free to become the person that God had created her to be and that God had wanted her to be. She was free to realize the beauty that only comes when you're free to worship God in spirit and truth and to live a life that of dedication to our holy and righteous God. So Mary Magdalene became a follower of Jesus. Jesus redeemed her. He cleansed her. And he saved her. And I wonder at the foot of that cross, when Mary, when Mary Magdalene saw how much her salvation cost, I wonder if how, the, just the dread and the torment that she must have felt knowing that Jesus Christ, her Savior, is on that cross partly because of her and the rest of mankind. You see, brothers and sisters, we need to understand that God doesn't just snap his fingers and everything, make, and everything goes away. He doesn't just snap his fingers and we're redeemed. We don't, he doesn't just wave a magic wand and all the sins of the world are gone. No, it's not that easy. You see, God had to be sacrificed, and he sacrificed himself in the form of his son. And he had to do so in order to make a perfect sin offering so that we can have a chance, have an opportunity for salvation. But it's only for those who put their faith in Christ Jesus as Lord. It's only for those who are baptized and live faithfully until the end that they shall receive a crown of life. I want you to listen to this story as I get ready to shut this lesson down. She said, to, uh, when we think of a story, it's a story basically of a daughter, um, a daughter and a mother. They go to an Easter play. And this mother takes her daughter. She's only about five years old, takes her to her first Easter play. And like most of the little girls at Easter plays, they're dressed up and they got the beautiful little dress and they might even have the matching hat and the little matching purse and the nice little shoes. And, and she's there with her mother and she's so excited to see her, to see her Jesus and because she's five years old. And so the play starts and Jesus is on the stage and he's playing with the little children. And she says, mother, let me go. Let me go up there, mother. And she says, Sweetie, it's just a play. It's not real. These are only actors. And she says, well, at least lift me up so Jesus could see my hat. And so the play goes on. And as the play was going on, all of a sudden there's that one part. There's that one part in the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus is crying out. And then after the Garden of Gethsemane, they come and they arrest Jesus. And, they, and as they're arresting Jesus, they're cursing and yelling and screaming. And it just looks so torturous. It looks so evil that she starts to cry and she buries her face in her mother's chest. And again, I told her, she says, she goes, honey, it's okay. It's only a play. These are only actors. It's not real. And so she opened her eyes to watch a little more. And then came that dreaded scene down the middle aisle of the auditorium when Jesus with the crown of thorns on his head and blood on his face, carrying his cross. And as, she makes, as he makes his way down the center aisle, this is just way too much. And she buries her face in my, in my chest again, and she starts to cry. And then there's that dreaded scene as they get Jesus to the stage. And all of a sudden, you hear the smack of the hammers as they're nailing Jesus to the cross. And she says, no, they're killing my Jesus. This is the eyes of a child where the gospel of Jesus Christ had become real. And she cried so long and so hard that the mother had to remove her from the auditorium. But you see, there was a place for, for parents to take their children in the back where there was a TV. And she continued to explain to her daughter that this isn't real, sweetie. This is just a play. These are actors. Jesus isn't harmed. He's fine. And he's going to come back out. But yet she wouldn't be consoled until she could see for herself her Savior, see for herself her Jesus. You see, many people were in the auditorium that day, and just like the mother, they had all gone to see a play. They had all gone to see a play that was made up by actors that wasn't real. 
But when we saw the gospel through the eyes of a child, the gospel absolutely became real once again. And so the question I leave you with here this morning is this. Has the gospel become just another story to you? Has the gospel lost all its significance, its meaning, and its appeal in your life? Have you been in the Lord so long that you no longer reflect upon the gospel of Jesus Christ? You no longer reflect upon his death, burial, and resurrection. You no longer really take the Lord's Supper all that serious. It's something we do. We do it every week. Let's get it over with. Or do you really reflect on that little piece of bread? That's the body of Christ. That was beaten for you. Do you really reflect upon the fruit of the vine that represents Jesus' blood that was shed and was poured out for you? Or has it just become another story in the midst of, well, many stories of life? Brothers and sisters, if it has, then maybe you need a healthy dose of a childlike faith. You remember when the disciples of Jesus Christ were forbidding the children from coming to him? What did Jesus say? Don't for forbid the children from coming to me. For you, adults, need to become like these children if you wish to enter into my kingdom. Why? Because they were pure. They were a pure heart. And so, brothers and sisters, we need to become like children. We need to always make sure we never forget the significance of what the Lord's Day means. And so this morning, we come to a time of decision. If you stand close enough to the cross of Jesus Christ, it will absolutely change you. But, or do you only want to get so close to the cross, but you don't actually have to sacrifice anything? You want the benefits of the cross, but you don't want to have to take responsibility for your part in putting Jesus on the cross. You need to come to a decision this morning how close you want to get. That's why I asked you earlier, where would you have been when Jesus was on that cross? Would you have been hiding out in fear? Or would you have had the type of faith that you would have stood beneath that cross and at least showed your support for your Lord and Savior, even if it cost you personally. We are living in a world right now where there is much animosity towards Christianity and towards the church. Are you willing to stand for Christ, even if it only means you stand alone? Are you willing to stand alone? To stand up for Jesus? to stand up for the teachings of the church that we have in the Holy Scriptures? Are you willing to do the right thing, even if you have to stand by yourself? Even if it's just you and a few of your brethren? You see, brethren, that's the reason why the Bible tells us there will be few who find it. Because there are few who are willing to live out their faith. There are few who are willing to stand beneath that cross and sacrifice on behalf of the Lord, if need be. If God calls us to have to stand up, in the 21st century, if we have to stand up for God and it causes us to be in prison, are you willing to go to prison? Are you willing to cross that line that the government may draw, that may draw in the line, may draw in the sand someday? Because your faith and your love and your dedication to your Lord, only time will tell. But I ask you to examine your faith and ask yourself the difficult questions. Brethren, as we examine this lesson here today, I, I want you to have the, the courage of the women of the cross to, to, uh, to not only encourage you, but I want you to be able to find the strength that those women had that very day as we, go to, as we get ready to offer the invitation. If you're here this morning and you need the prayers of the church, let us pray for you. If you need to have a more bold and courageous faith, let us pray for you. If you have been away from the church for so long and you wish to be restored, you can do that this morning as well. If you're here this morning and you're not a child of God, but you wish to become a child of God, you could do that now. You can be baptized for the remission of your sins. You receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and God himself will add you to the kingdom. Come forward as we stand and sing the song of invitation. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The cross behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me. 
the cross before me. No turning back, no turning back. Though you go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. No turning back, no turning back. Will you decide now to follow Jesus? Will you decide now to follow Jesus? Will you decide now to follow Jesus? No turning back. This morning at our 9.30 service, uh, Chris Egan came forward, and he's the new police chief in Allen Park, asking for the prayers of the church. Uh, it's, a, it's a great responsibility to be a police chief. And you know how our police officers have been demonized and cut down and, and cursed and, and persecuted. So we want to pray for Chris and all of those that are serving us in law enforcement. And Chris was very heartfelt wanting those prayers this morning. So please pray for Chris. He also asked us to pray for Brenna Fry. Uh, Brenna Fry has been facing a lot of medical and, and uh, health problems over the last year. So let's, let's raise Brenna's uh, name to the Lord as well for her help and her encouragement. Now, Darren, when you lead us in prayer, please pray for Chris and Brenna. Good God in prayer. Father, we just want to lift up Chris and, and Brenna and the other ones who were mentioned this morning in, uh, to you this morning. Father, they are dear to our hearts, and we know they are dear to you as well. Father, please bless each one in their situations and give them courage and strength. <clears throat> Father, we pray that you would help us to always keep the awesome meaning of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ fresh in our hearts. Father, may we never lose that meaning. The salvation for us and the whole world. Father, we also ask that you would help us to follow the example of faith and courage of these four women that we studied this morning. Father, help us to have that kind of faith, that regardless of the cost, we will follow Jesus. Regardless of the risk to our lives, we will do what is right, what is honorable, and what pleases you. Father, would keep, help us keep these thoughts in our minds this week as we, as we walk the walk that you've given us. Help us to do so in a manner pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.